In this video, I'll demonstrate the renal ultrasound procedure, including acquisition of longitudinal and transverse use of the native kidneys and urinary bladder. I'll also briefly demonstrate the renal transplant ultrasound and the renal resistive indices. Note that I'll not be saving the images here, but unless your main purpose is to quickly tool out hydronephrosis by the bedside, a comprehensive interpretation of the renal sonogram is ideally made using a image viewing software. So if you want to write a full official report, you need to save the images and review them later. And, and don't worry, we have a whole video dedicated to interpretation of common abnormalities that we see on renal sonography. Probe holding. So how to hold the probe in a right way? Grasp the probe with the first three fingers of your dominant hand. And depending on what part of the body you're scanning, you can use your uh, um, ring and little finger or the heel of your hand to stabilize the probe on the patient's body so that it doesn't slide down, especially when you're using a lot of gel. That way you don't have to apply too much pressure on patient's body while stabilizing the probe when you're reaching out to the machine to switch modes or measure something. However, it might not be always possible to do these, especially when you are standing by the bedside and uh, the bed cannot be adjusted according to your height or the patient cannot follow instructions, uh, that sort of thing. The basic transducer movements. There are five movements of the transducer and becoming familiar with the terminology makes it easy to follow the lectures or uh, it makes it easier when you are reading textbook for the procedure. And the first movement is called sliding, where the whole transducer is moving along its long axis or short axis. And this movement is used to scan larger area before finding the organ of interest, such as you finding the liver before the kidney. And the next movement is called rotation. And you can rotate the probe in the counterclockwise direction or in the clockwise direction. And this movement is called tilting or sweeping or fanning and it's done along the transducer's short axis. And sometimes when I say look to the right or look to the left, this is the movement I'm referring to. And the next movement is called rocking or heel toeing, which means tilting the probe but along the long axis instead of short axis. And the fifth movement is called compression, and it's essentially pressing the transducer, usually to displace bowel gas or to assess uh, if the blood vessel is artery or vein. So we'll go to the right kidney, sagittal view imaging. And the probe that we use to perform kidney imaging is curved array probe. Or if you don't have the curved array probe on the machine, you can also use the phased array or the cardiac probe. Um, and if you are scanning children or neonates, you can use a microconvex array probe, which is a curved probe, but it's a smaller one. And we use low frequency probes to visualize the kidneys because as we saw before, low frequency waves penetrate deeper and uh, will get optimal imaging. And imaging the right kidney is easier than the left because liver provides a larger acoustic window. Two hurdles for optimal image acquisition are rib shadows and bowel gas. It's typically performed with the patient lying in supine position and can use either anterior or lateral window, but usually one window is better than the other depending on the patient's body habitus. Um, other maneuvers such as left lateral decubitus, holding the breath after a deep breath may be required for some patients, like we will see in our subject later. And uh, you may not be able to avoid rib shadows altogether, and sometimes you might have to evaluate kidney in two parts. So a good way to start uh, scanning is to place the probe in the mid-axillary line in the 10th rib space um, with the probe pointer facing towards patient's head. And some people also prefer using the junction of sub line and the anterior axillary line. And it's also important to note that kidneys are obliquely positioned in the body, so imaging planes are not truly longitudinal and uh, truly transverse in relation to the body. We are just talking about longitudinal axis of the kidney and transverse axis of the kidney. And kidneys lie in pretty much the same plane as uh, the ribs. Once you are able to get the entire kidney into view, you should uh, sweep the probe uh, 
side to side so that all sections of the kidney come into the field um, so that we don't miss any smaller lesions, such as if you have a small cyst or small stone that can be easily missed if you don't perform this sweeping movements uh, anterior to posterior or posterior to anterior. Once you find a good longitudinal view of the kidney, then from the same position, turn the probe 90 degrees in counterclockwise direction to find the transverse view. Taking a deep breath and holding will give a better view sometimes uh, if the patient is able to cooperate. And transducer is then swept up and down to view both upper and lower poles. Mid pole of the kidney is C-shaped due to structures entering and leaving the kidney like you can see in this Doppler picture. And as you go towards uh, both ends, they become circular. So you see here you are doing the sweeping movements and we are seeing the C-shaped mid pole and as you go towards up and down, the kidney is becoming circular in the transverse view. Imaging of the left kidney um, is more challenging than the right as spleen provides a smaller window than the liver and uh, it's located more lateral and posterior and if you go more anteriorly, you can encounter bowel gas. So you may need more lateral approach and actually sonographer might have to press uh, his or her knuckles onto the bed when you're doing it in the supine position. And right lateral decubitus position may be frequently needed like in our patient. So we ask the patient to uh, turn to his right and uh, we put the probe in similar position as we did for the right kidney and uh, you rotated the probe slightly towards patient's back uh, in the superior portion. That way you place the probe in an oblique manner and you found the longitudinal view of the kidney. And uh, it might not be always um, possible to get spleen in the view as we would want to uh, because of the bowel gas and uh, patient's body habitus. Once you find a good longitudinal view, then turn the probe 90 degrees counterclockwise and then you'll find the transverse view of the left kidney. And uh, as you saw with the right kidney, the mid pole of the kidney is more uh, C-shaped because of the structures entering and leaving the kidney. And as you go towards uh, up and down, the poles become circular. And important measurements that you want to take. Um, when you freeze uh, the screen in the longitudinal view of the kidney, there are three important measurements you should consider taking. The first thing is length of the kidney, which is um, uh, the greatest pole to pole distance in the sagittal plane. And uh, it has poor precision. That's important thing to note, so that this measurement should be performed several times and once you try to get the maximum length of the kidney in view, because even for a six feet tall patient, sometimes you, you measure the kidney to be around nine centimeters, uh, which is probably not true. So you have to try to get the whole kidney in view and the longest possible uh, view of the kidney uh, to measure the length. And the second measurement that you take is cortical thickness. And cortical thickness is measured perpendicularly from outer margin of the kidney to the base of the pyramid, if you are able to see the pyramids clearly. And it's usually done uh, in the mid-kidney region. And normal cortical thickness is around 0.7 to 1.1 centimeters. And with chronic kidney disease, the cortical thickness tends to decrease. As you know, we all look at uh, cortical echogenicity. We compare echogenicity of the cortex to that of uh, uh, liver or spleen and here in this image you can see the cortex is uh, darker compared to that of liver so it's normal so normal cortex is either hypoechogenic or isoechoic compared to that of liver or spleen and just because the cortical echogenicity increases we cannot always label it as chronic kidney disease but if increased cortical echogenicity is accompanied by decreased cortical thickness then it's probably CKD because as we know, increased echogenicity can be seen with um, acute tubular necrosis or other acute glomerulonephritis with inflammatory infiltrates in the cortex. And what if you are not able to see the medullary pyramids clearly? Then you can use something that is called parenchymal thickness, which is essentially 
the thickness of the whole renal parenchyma, uh, which acts as a surrogate for um, uh, cortical thickness. So for parenchymal thickness, you measure from uh, outer margin of the kidney to the tip of the pyramid. Of course, if you are not able to see the pyramids clearly, you measure um, till you see the sinus fat. That would give you the parenchymal thickness. And normal parenchymal thickness is about 1.4 to 2 centimeters. It's almost twice as much as um, cortical thickness. Now, you may also want to perform color Doppler examination of the kidney to identify flow in the kidney, or you might want to measure resistive indices by measuring the um, velocities inside the blood vessels. Using pulsed wave Doppler, we can measure resistive indices. The resistive index um, is measured by the formula peak systolic velocity minus end diastolic velocity divided by peak systolic velocity. It, it's essentially uh, a measure of degree of intrarenal arterial impedance. And in clinical practice, the value of resistive index of around 0.8 is used to discriminate between normal and pathologic resistance to flow. So where do you measure resistive index? Usually, we do it at the level of interlobar arteries here or segmental arteries because we get better and reproducible blood flow. You can also do it at the level of arcuate arteries at the corticomedullary junction. Uh, and which artery is better is a little controversial, but uh, we get the best signals for evaluation from large segmental or interlobar arteries, and uh, they also lie uh, parallel to the ultrasound beam which is the ideal um, angle for the color Doppler. Remember we discussed when we were discussing the angle, for a ideal grayscale image, you want the ultrasound beam to be perpendicular to the organ of interest. But to get an ideal color flow capture, you want the beam to be as parallel to the vessel as possible, or at least uh, at an angle less than 60 degrees. So these arteries, uh, that is interlobar arteries, are more in line with the ultrasound beam and so you'll get a better reading. But in clinical practice, we use uh, both interlobar uh, and arcuate blood vessels. So this is how you do a power Doppler exam. So when you turn on the power Doppler, you get a line like this with a small opening. It's called Doppler gate, and you bring this gate to the vessel of interest, and then it will give you a tracing like this, and th this is essentially recording of uh, velocities uh, in the blood vessel of interest. So the top part of this peak is called peak systolic velocity, and the end part is the end diastolic velocity. You stop this tracing and uh, measure those velocities, and the machine will calculate the resistive index for you. Now we'll go to the bladder examination. For optimal bladder examination, we need it to be full and the patient should be in supine position and the suprapubic area needs to be exposed. Examine the bladder um, sagittally in the midline with probe marker pointing towards patient's head. And now angle slightly laterally and sweep the probe left and right to check the lateral margins. And rotate the probe 90 degrees uh, to the axial plane and sweep from superior dome to the bladder base, ensure ultrasim, uh, sorry, ultrasound beam is projected as close to perpendicular to the bladder wall as possible. In the transverse plane, bladder appears more or less rectangular, and in the sagittal plane, it appears um, in triangular um, shape. And these shapes appear only um, when the bladder is full and uh, partially filled bladder can have various shapes. And because fluid is black on ultrasound, a bladder filled with urine is black. And uh, sometimes you can see ureteral jets coming from the posterior wall of the bladder. Like from here, you can see some jets appearing uh, into the bladder that we showed in the first video when we were discussing the uh, normal um, ultrasound and uh, stronger jet on one side and weaker jet on the symptomatic side if the patient presents with flank pain may point towards ureteral obstruction on, on the symptomatic side. Once we find the bladder, now we take the 
measurements so to measure the bladder volume so in the transverse plane you freeze the image and measure um, side to side diameter and the anterior posterior diameter okay so you got uh, two readings here around 11 cm and uh, 9 cm and uh, now you get the length of the bladder in the sagittal direction so now you measure uh, length of the bladder so you get a third dimension now and uh, one of the frequent uh, equations that you use to estimate bladder volume is the formula for uh, volume of an ellipsoid which is length multiplied by width multiplied by height multiplied by 0.52 um, essentially you can just multiply your three readings and divide the product by two which gives a pretty much uh, same reading in our patient the bladder volume is approximately 650 cc based on the measurements we got just now now we'll go to the transplant renal ultrasound in majority of the cases the renal transplant is placed in the retroperitoneal space of the right iliac fossa and the transplanted ureter is implanted in the superior aspect of the bladder uh, so first you have to identify the location of the allograft by palpation and get an idea of the orientation and uh, place the probe accordingly with probe marker facing uh, upwards and obtain the longitudinal images and also note that when you're doing transplant renal ultrasound you might have to decrease the depth because the kidney is very superficial otherwise you might not get good images and otherwise uh, you'll get uh, uh, other structures that you don't need to evaluate and sometimes you might have to use a lower frequency um, sorry higher frequency transducer uh, to be able to uh, get better images and bladder may be in close proximity of the kidney and uh, you shouldn't uh, confuse that with a perinephric collection because that's one of the key purposes that you're doing a um, transplant renal ultrasound, especially in the post-operative period, to see if there are any um, collections uh, in the perinephric space. So scan in both the longitudinal and transverse planes. Uh, it looks pretty much same as the native kidney, uh, as long as you're able to um, put the probe in the right direction. Uh, another thing to note here is that uh, mild distension of renal pelvis and calyces uh, might be acceptable, especially if it's unchanged from the prior scan, um, because vesicoureteral reflux is frequently seen in this patient population due to altered uh, anatomy of the ureter and bladder anastomosis. In the next few slides, uh, we'll show you still images of uh, renal resistive indices. So you know how to uh, measure the resistive index that we saw in the previous slide and so you get a graph like this so this is at uh, your Doppler gate this one right here is placed uh, on the main renal artery uh, just as it entered the kidney and you get a graph like this these velocities are higher than than interior of the kidney so here you got peak systolic velocity you got end diastolic velocity and the machine calculates the resistive index to be around 0.8 and now you go deeper into the kidney and here uh, we are measuring at the level of arcuate arteries that is at the junction of cortex and medulla and uh, now the Doppler gate is at the superior arcuate uh, artery level and uh, you got a tracing again peak systolic and diastolic and the resistive index is 0.62 and once you get superior arcuate then go to mid pole of the kidney and you get a similar tracing and the resistive index here is 0.73 and then you go to inferior arcuate and you get a similar tracing and the resistive index is 0.71 that means like if you take an average of all these uh, three measurements you get the resistive index to be around 0.7 which is pretty much normal that's it for kidney and transplant ultrasound. We'll talk about other bedside point of care ultrasound in the next video.